Hey folks, welcome to Fails of Flails. Today in this video I'm going to be covering Mounted Combat by Special Request and I actually had a lot of fun with this video. Because the player's handbook doesn't say a whole lot about Mounted Combat, it leaves things pretty open-ended which means there's a lot that you can really do with it. It kind of follows the uh, D&D 5e set of make rulings, not rules, and so it's really great. I'm going to go over a lot of things including uh, just the basic rules for it, some more things that you can do for it, uh, some cool other rules that interact with it, and then uh, if you really want to make like a mounted fighter or something like that, I'm also going to be covering uh, feats, magic items that you want, and then at the end covering some homebrew uh, to maybe cover in or fill in some of the holes that the system really leaves for a DM to interpret or decide on. So without further ado, let's get rolling. Come on, come on, come on. Ah. If you turn to page 198 in the player's handbook, you see that the three requirements for a creature to be considered a mount is that they must be willing, they must be at least one size larger than the rider, and they must have the proper anatomy. The willing part is obviously included in there, so a player can't say that they are mounted if they hop on the top of a dragon that they're fighting. The one size larger just kind of makes sense because, uh, you know, a human probably can't ride around on the back of a mastiff. And the uh, proper anatomy is pretty open-ended to whatever the DM wants to say works, but it's fair to assume that... Obviously the players aren't going to be able to ride around on the back of an ooze or something like that. Moving on to mounting and dismounting, it requires half of your movement speed and you can only do it once per turn, probably just so you don't spam it somehow. Uh, also if your mount gets moved against its will or if you are knocked prone while mounted you must make a DC 10 dexterity saving throw or fall prone within 5 feet of the mount. Also if your mount is knocked prone you can use your reaction to hop off and land uh, on your feet within 5 feet of the mount. Otherwise, you also land prone next to the mount. The last section is about controlling the mount, and this here is where it can get a little bit complicated at times. When you ride on a creature, you have two options. You can either control it or allow it to act independently. If it is an intelligent creature, such as a dragon, it always acts independently and you cannot control it. It doesn't actually give a cutoff for what is considered an intelligent creature, but we can say that it maybe requires an intelligence score of around 5 or 6. It also says that you can only control a mount if it has been tamed, although it is assumed that a domesticated creature such as a donkey or a horse is probably uh, tamed or trained when you buy it. It doesn't give any rules for training a mount, although I'll get to some uh, homebrew suggestions at the end of the video. When you control a mount, its initiative changes to yours, and you're able to move it as you decide, and it can only take the dodge, disengage, and dash actions, even if it otherwise had normal attacks that it can take. So this is kind of one of the downsides of controlling a mount. Intelligent creatures who uh, don't obviously uh, be controlled, they retain their initiative even if you are mounting them. If you are riding a creature that acts independently, it maintains its own initiative and its actions are not restricted in the same ways that a controlled creature are. So if it, ha if it has attacks, it can still attack normally. Uh, however, there is a possibility that it may flee from battle if it gets spooked by a fireball or something. And it may go and attack an enemy that is different from the one that you wanted to. So uh, because it, you know, if it is a trained animal, or it is uh, used to combat, it's kind of up to how your DM wants to rule it. Uh, you know, if you have a war elephant that is trained for battle, obviously, uh, the DM may rule it that it is still going to have a general idea of what you want it to do, even if you're not controlling it. And the last little tidbit that is offered in the player's handbook is that if the mount's movement provokes an attack of opportunity, the attacking creature can either target you or the mount. Now, if it takes a disengage action, uh, that obviously means that uh, it can't be targeted by attack of opportunity, but you also cannot be targeted by attack of opportunity because you are technically moving against your will. For the dodge action, if it takes that, that only applies to the mount and not to you, the rider. The important point to note here is that if you're controlling the mount, its initiative changes to match yours. However, your turns do not join together, so you still have to choose whether the mount goes first or you goes first, which means if the mount's going first, yes, you can run in, and then on your turn you can attack, but then because the mount's turn is over, it can't really go anywhere else. If you go first and you're right next to the enemy, that's great. You can attack, then you can have your mount uh, disengage and run away, but you're not going to be able to run in, attack, and on the same turn, uh, run away on your mount. So that is something to keep in mind. Honestly, if you have a mount that can make attacks and can actually make like valuable attacks, such as like an elephant, which can do really decent amount of damage, it's usually probably better to just uh, go ahead and allow the mount to act independently, especially if it knows what it's doing, because if you're going for like the mobility thing, then a horse is going to be better, but if you're using a mount to just try to get more damage in, then uh, allowing it to tack on its turn is going to be a lot more valuable. If you are looking to make a character who is, you know, dashing all about the battlefield on their mount, and you want to be able to run in, attack, and run away on the same turn while still remaining on your mount, then maybe you could talk your DM into allowing a homebrew, where basically when you are mounting and controlling a creature, your turns do actually join. 
Uh, this way you can use the mount's uh, speed to move about, you can use your action to attack or cast spells, and the mount can use a bonus action, or your bonus action in this case, to dash, disengage, or dodge. In my opinion, this is a pretty fair trade-off. If you're staying on the mount, you're probably only using its speed to get around the battlefield anyway. Only you can use your action, so it's not like the uh, horse or the mount can dash twice in one turn. And while it can dash, disengage, or dodge as a bonus action, that is something that the rogue gets pretty early on, and so it's not so broken of an idea. And not to mention, if you use your bonus action to, say, attack or cast a uh, spell that has a cast of time of a bonus action, then the mount can't use those that bonus action to dash, disengage, or dodge. These next rules I'm going to be talking about here aren't actually written anywhere in the player's handbook, uh, but they are confirmed on Twitter by Jeremy Crawford, who is the principal rules designer for D&D 5e, so you can pretty much assume that they are canon. The first one here is actually a little bit weird, but if you start initiative and you are not controlling the mount, uh, and its initiative is higher than yours, it actually gets its turn uh, before yours, obviously, and can use its action and its movement. However, then, if you control the mount on your turn, its initiative changes to yours, and assuming that you are going first, it actually gets another turn and can use its movement again. The next rule here actually isn't technically an official rule, but, uh, you know, Jeremy Crawford says it, so it is something that, uh, if you are a DM, you may consider. Because the turns are separate if you're going by rules are written, then the DM may allow for the order of the turns to change each round. So if the mount is going first one turn, then maybe the next turn, or sorry, next round, the rider is actually going first. This would make things a lot easier for if a player wanted to get in, make their attacks, obviously both their turns are over. Uh, then the next round, the rider goes ahead and makes their attacks, taking their turn, and then the amount is back up to ride off. So that is something to keep in mind. It doesn't necessarily have to stay static every time, but it is something that may get a little bit, uh, you know, convoluted or confusing if you're switching around too much. So it's up to you as a DM uh, to decide what you want to do. And the last little bit here is that if you are riding a large or larger mount, obviously uh, going by the rules of the game, they are taking up four or more spaces on a game board or whatever else you're using. And so on your turn, you can use your movement to move about the top of the mount. However, this can still provoke an opportunity attack uh, assuming that you are within range of an adjacent enemy. So these next few ones are actually some combinations of rules for some interesting effects. The first one being that the rogue can actually add their sneak attack damage to uh, basically all melee attacks against adjacent creatures while they are mounted. This is because with the rogue sneak attack, assuming you are using a ranged or a finesse weapon, as long as you have advantage on the attack or if there is an enemy uh, adjacent to the target who is not incapacitated ne next to the target, then you also get to add your sneak attack damage. And because your mount is considered an enemy of the target, uh, then you automatically get to add your sneak attack damage to all the melee attacks you make against creatures who are adjacent to the, your mount. Now, if you got a larger mount, like an elephant or, I guess, even a horse if you're on the other side, you can also add this for ranged weapons, assuming that there is at least a uh, space between you and the enemy. If you have the protection fighting style, you can also use your action to grant attacks against your mount disadvantage, which can be huge. Uh, especially for a lot of uh, mounts, like the horse, I believe, has an AC of 11, and an uh, elephant has an AC of 12. Um, so super easy to hit, so just giving that disadvantage there can be a real help if you're trying to keep your mount alive. You can also dual-wield lances while you're mounted, which is pretty fun to think about. Uh, this is because while you're mounted, a lance is considered only a one-handed weapon. Uh, so if you combine this with the dual-wielder feat, which removes the uh, requirement that a weapon must be light, for you to use your bonus action to attack when dual wielding, you can actually make two attacks on your turn with both of your lances. If you also combine this with the uh, two weapon fighting fighting style, two, two weapon fighting style, uh, whatever it is, that means you can add your strength modifier onto that bonus attack as well. So each round, assuming you don't have an extra attack, you still get two attacks with your lances for 1d12 plus your strength, so that's a pretty good deal. Before I move on to items, I'm going to mention the mounted combatant feat. If you plan on making a mounted fighter, mounted ranger, spellcaster, whatever it is, I 100% guarantee taking this feat because it's going to give you so many bonuses that it would be foolish not to use it. First bonus it gives you is you get advantage on melee attacks against any unmounted creature that is smaller than your mount. And considering the average mount is probably a horse, which are considered large creatures, this means you get advantage against all humanoids that I can think of. If you go with an elephant, which is considered huge, then you get advantage for melee attacks against anything that's large and smaller, which is a really solid portion of the monster manual. So that is 
I mean, just advantage for doing what you were planning on doing already. The next one is huge. This is that you can make any attack that would be targeting your mount target you instead. And what makes this so powerful is that it's not even a reaction. So no matter how many times people are trying to target your mount, you can choose for it to just target you instead. And uh, the, what's really good about this is a lot of the mounts that I mentioned before, the Warhorse, the Elephant, they have really low ACs. They're super easy to hit. Whereas, you know, if you're up there with plate armor and a shield, so you've got an AC of 20, that means uh, all the attacks you're having uh, redirected to you instead, a lot of them are going to be missing. So it doesn't even matter if your mount has low HP. And the final bonus that the mounted combatant feat gives you is that if your mount would be forced to make a dexterity saving throw to avoid uh, taking damage, they only take half damage on a failure and take no damage on a success. So this, again, is huge because not only uh, from the previous bonus, can uh, attack rolls only target your mount when you allow them. Now the only way to actually deal damage is do uh, probably with an area effect spell, which now all of that is automatically halved. So if you plan on making a mounted fighter or a mounted character, I 100% recommend getting this feat. Moving on to items, the most basic of things that you can get for your mount is barding. This is just armor that you buy for your mount. Uh, the price of it is four times the normal cost, so for plate mail, which is normally 1,500 gold, it is going to be 6,000 gold to get for your mount. But considering all the mounts have really low AC, I would recommend it. It's worth the cost uh, just because it's so easy to hit an AC of 11 or 12 that anytime, especially if you don't have the mounted combatant feet, basically anytime somebody attacks your mount, they're probably going to hit. And especially with a war horse, I think it has an AC or a HP of like 11 or 12, it's probably going to go down super easy, especially once you get to those higher levels. Now, talking about magic items, uh, some of these may be a little bit iffy, so you're going to have to talk to your DM about them, or uh, you as a DM may allow it to slide, may not, it's really up to you. Uh, but plus one, plus two, plus three armor for a mount uh, is going to be huge, especially, like I said, because they normally have low AC. Uh, tack that onto, say, like a plus three plate armor for a mount, that is a huge bonus. Now, obviously, it's probably not very likely to find armor that is made for a mount specifically, especially if they've got like an elephant or something, but I mean, I may be wrong. Uh, the Dungeon Master's Guide does say, however, that magic items will resize to fit the creature that wears them. So, I mean, if that includes mounts, then you're good to go. But otherwise, you know, they may need to specifically seek that out. Horseshoes of a Zephyr are specifically made for a mount. They make it so the mount floats off the ground a couple inches or maybe a foot, uh, basically allowing them to run across water or lava, anything like that. They don't really get a flying speed, but it does really make them a lot more maneuverable. Uh, there's also the Horseshoes of Speed, which I believe increases their speed by 30 feet, which is great if you really want to be that mobile character during combat. Looking at the Mythic Odyssey of Theros, they also added the Flying Chariot. Uh, this gives a plus one bonus to AC for both the mount as well as the uh, character who is riding the chariot. And on top of that, if the mount flies, the chariot will as well. Uh, there are a few other items which are kind of up in the air and really up to you as a DM if you're going to allow it. But a ring of protection, an amulet of health, and a belt of giant strength could all technically maybe work for a mount, but it's really uh, up to the DM how they want to rule it for those. So just how awesome can mounted combat be? I'll uh, set the scene a little bit here. Imagine you've got a plate mail covered elephant. You're sitting up top of it, probably with a pike or something, so you can reach down to creatures on the ground. And because the elephant is also huge, you've got like three or four of the people who are sitting up there who are just hucking javelins or shooting bows from the top of it because they can. You're allowing your elephant to uh, basically act independently because that way it gets its attacks. And so on its turn it can move and it has a speed of 40 feet and as long as it moves up to 20 feet prior to making a gore attack, uh, which also does 3d8 plus 6 piercing damage, the creature that attacks must make a DC 12 strength saving throw and on failure gets knocked prone. And the elephant can also then use its bonus action to stomp for 3d 10 plus 6 bludgeoning damage. You've also probably got the mountain combatant feet, so all attacks against creatures who are smaller than your elephant, which is probably all of them, are all made with advantage. And any attack that you want that's made against your elephant, you can make it target you instead. And when somebody does decide to bring out the fireball to try to get all y'all, the elephant only takes half damage at the most unless it succeeds. Now an elephant only costs 200 gold. You can get a feat at level 1 if you play a variant human. So at level 1, you can already have most of this minus the plate mail for your elephant. And if you have multiple players and you all pool your gold, you can get multiple elephants and basically have a full cavalry charge of huge, basically demon beasts 
charging at whatever people you want out in an open field or wherever you're fighting. It's obviously not practical if you're going into a dungeon, but while you are above ground, you are probably dominating anybody that you're fighting. So now to discuss a few homebrew ideas you may want to incorporate into your own games or try to talk your DM into using. Uh, the first one is going to be actually about allowing the mounts to level up. Uh, obviously because they're not a class, they're not going to get any class abilities, but as they level up they are going to get more HP, just making them more durable. Uh, the main reason I say this is because you know, at lower levels, it's not that big of a deal that a warhorse has only 19 HP. They can probably survive several attacks, uh, maybe even 5 or 6. However, once you're getting up to like level 10 and you got a lot of enemies that you're fighting who are dealing at least that much damage with a single attack, that horse is going to be going down completely. And, uh, you know, if their character, or one of your players, really wants to be using a mount on a regular basis and you're not trying to punish them for it, this is a good way to just make that mount more durable without necessarily making them stronger. And considering Tasha's Cauldron of Everything added rules for sidekicks that players can hire, which can also level up alongside them, uh, having a mount which just gets more HP as players level up too isn't that big of a deal. Uh, maybe you every four levels you also give them that ASI, so they're increasing constitution, strength, or dexterity. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. So after every battle you're not having to go and buy another mount or you're not traveling with like six elephants because they just keep dying on you. I would also recommend using this if you have a player who is a Beastmaster Ranger, uh, mainly because they obviously have a connection to that uh, mount or the beast, whatever it is, like a wolf or a panther. Um, you know, in the early levels, you know, it could be pretty powerful, but like I said again, once you get into upper levels, it's really becoming more of a liability because they just not as durable as you know some of the players are who may have you know 50 60 hp while the uh you know the beastmaster's little friend there is still sitting at like 19 or 20. so allowing it to level up really or even just increase its hp isn't game breaking at all it's not dealing any more damage it's just becoming a little bit more sturdy to add on top of that whether the uh, player in question is a beastmaster ranger or just a person who wants to have a mount uh, it's also going to help for i guess role play purposes um, if they have the same mount throughout, you know, their entire journey. If they're switching up mounts, you know, every few battles because it just keeps dying, then they probably don't have any sort of connection whatsoever to that mount, and they're perfectly fine with allowing that mount to work as a meat shield for them. Whereas, you know, if that's the mount that they've been with since level 1, and it survived because you've allowed its HP to increase, and so it can, you know, withstand the battles, then I guarantee you that player is going to have a much greater connection with that mount, and that can really make for some great role-playing opportunities in your own games. The last bit of homebrew and the last point in this video I'll talk about is uh, covering how to tame a mount, because there is no written rule in any of the books that I've found anywhere. What I would recommend is that taming a mount requires a number of weeks equal to their CR, uh, with a minimum of one week. So a war horse, um, uh, just a riding or a draft horse or a mastiff, I'm pretty sure those are all CR 1 or lower, so those would all take one week to tame whereas something like an elephant would take a full four weeks. If they're trying to tame something like a griffin, that would take even longer. I don't actually know what CR off the top of my head. However, with an exotic creature like that, you may actually want to double the time or just uh, say it's like one and a half times. So if a griffin was, say, CR4, I don't know if it is, it would take six weeks instead because on top of that being an exotic creature and there maybe being uh, a little bit more difficult to tame, the rider would also have to learn how to control a flying mount, because I guarantee you that's going to be a little bit different. It could also require an animal handling check every day that uh, during the training, and with every failed animal handling check, say DC 12 or something like that, maybe higher for a more intelligent or a larger or higher CR creature, uh, it actually extends the day. So we basically say that that day doesn't count because you didn't pass the animal handling check, so training gets extended by one more day. If they fail three or more times during a week, then maybe uh, one of three bad things could happen. The training time could completely reset, the mount may become aggressive and try to kill the uh, creature or the character that is taming it, or maybe the mount just becomes completely untamable and the player has to find a different mount instead. That's all I've got for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you did, make sure to like and subscribe. Also leave a comment down below. Uh, what are your own thoughts about mounted combat? What are your, some of your own experiences? And uh, what other topics would you like to see me cover? That's all I've got, like I said. So thanks for watching and have a great day.